Good morning, folks. Happy Monday morning. Hope you're all well and happy. Uh, I want to take you through quickly the stuff that's in this week's folder and talk about how you might use it. And then I want to give you some a, a little reinforcement of our purposes here because I know some people are still struggling. And then I want to, uh, I'm going to give you an essay topic that if you're still having trouble finding one, use the one I'm going to give you and you'll be fine. All right. First off, let me say uh, I'm normally in my classes on Blackboard uh, four to six hours every day, including weekends. But this week I'm going to be doing some traveling and uh, I probably won't be terribly available on Tuesday and Wednesday. Uh, I'll check in as I can uh, and if anything seems urgent I'll try to respond to that. But I'm going to be um, a little slower probably on Tuesday and Wednesday, probably frankly all of this week. But Tuesday and Wednesday I'm going to be traveling for sure. Okay, so just be aware of that if you don't get as immediate a response as you're used to. Uh, I'll, I'll get back to you. Um, okay, so... I've got this week's folder open up on the, my, my desktop here, and I'm going to take you through this stuff quickly. You might want to open yours up and go along, uh, go along uh, with me. Um, I guess if you're viewing this video, you've already got your desktop open, don't you? Okay, so you got this week's lecture. That's what you're looking at now. That gives some advice about what we're doing this week. What we're doing this week is you're preparing a draft for peer review next week. Uh, I'm not going to preach at you about the incredible value of doing drafts, uh, engaging in the drafting process always results, always, always results in a better product, period, end of discussion. I'm an expert in teaching writing, I'm an expert in writing, I've been writing for 40 years, I know what I'm talking about, okay? So you need to do a draft this week. Uh, and the point value for this draft, and the draft doesn't have to be perfect, by the way. Uh, the draft should be fairly well organized into some paragraphs and maybe a stab at an introduction and a conclusion. And some uh, willingness to use the evidence to support your ideas. It doesn't have to be finished. doesn't have to be perfect. You're going to perfect it next week. So don't wait for it to be beautifully, perfectly finished because you'll wait for what can't possibly happen in the drafting process. Drafting process is a mess. And you make a big mess and then you clean up your mess. That's how it works. Um, it's, it really is that simple. So anyway, I was, I was saying the point value for this draft is punitive. If you don't do it, you will lose 20 points. That's a letter grade on the final. So if you don't do a draft, there's no possible way you'll get an A on this essay. I don't know if that matters to you or not. Um, it's odd to me that uh, a large number of students simply refuse to do drafts, and I think it's possibly because we don't explain to you carefully enough uh, what it's about. It's about getting your ideas out on paper so that you can see them, and then you hand the paper off to someone else, and you say, look, here, here's a paragraph. What do you see me saying in this paragraph? And that peer reviewer feeds back your ideas. And if the ideas coming back to you from the peer reviewer are not the ideas you thought you wrote in the paragraph, if there's a disconnect, then that's an area you need to fix and clean up. Because if there's a disconnect between you and your peer reviewer, there's going to be a disconnect between you and your end recipient, i.e. me, and your grade will go down. It's that simple. Uh, it's, this is not, again, rocket science. That's how it gets done. Uh, and, you know, students are either willing to cooperate or not. You have to make that choice for yourself. Again, this is college, you're adults, and I'm not your mother, so you do as you wish. But just be aware, if you don't do a draft of some kind, um, you will lose 20 points. The other reason for doing a draft is to get it, get something up there at low risk so that I can take a look at it and advise you. Now, there are 25 or so of you left in the class, and I won't have a lot of time to spend on every one. But if you get me a draft and get it up there by next Monday, I will take a look at it and spend at least five minutes with it and write you back with some advice. Which, again, you know, you can take it or leave it. The draft, This is your paper, and it's your work. But that will allow both your colleagues to feedback ideas so you can check for clarity. It will also allow me to help you to the best of my ability if you do the draft. If you already decided you're not going to do the draft, then you lose 20 points and the discussion ends. That's up to you. Okay, so quick look at the this week's stuff. 
there are two assignments up there. Please notice the first assignment you come to is the assignment for the draft. It's in red letters. That's what's due this week. I also put up at the very bottom of the page the final link for the final assignment, which is not due this week. It's due next week. So please put your draft in the draft slot. Don't put your draft in the final slot at the bottom of the page because I won't be able to see it then. In fact, I may just make that um, final draft, final version link go away for this week. It may confuse folks. Okay, then there are the forums. Uh, there are some questions there designed to help you focus your, your writing this week. Um, and I'll try to help with that at the best I can. Then there's the office hour. Let me just click over there. Okay. Then there's the general questions. The office hour. Oh, sorry. Let me go back to the office hour. I'll try to remember, but i got to tell you, there's a nine-hour time difference between California and where I'm going to be on Wednesday. Um, and it's going to be in the evening. I think about 7 o'clock in the evening when it's 10 o'clock in California. So I'll try to remember if I don't make it into the office hour, uh, please know that I will respond to uh, emails and, and general questions post. Uh, frankly, no one has used, not one single student has used the office hour yet. Uh, and we're four weeks in. So, um, but anyway, if, I, if I'm not there, uh, forgive me. Okay. Then there's a whole bunch of stuff, all of which should be fairly familiar to you. It's kind of a rehash of stuff from my English 1A class uh, where students are learning this stuff. Uh, my assumption, since English 1A is a prerequisite for this class, you don't have to learn any of this brand new, but you might need a little reminder of how things work. Again, writing an academic college level essay works a certain way and not other ways. Uh, so you, you follow the recipe and you're fine. Um, and you play it safe and you get the job done and get a good grade and you move on. Okay, so the first thing is how to pick a paper topic. Uh, as I said, I wrote this for a Shakespeare class uh, quite some years ago, but it works for everything. Find out what you're interested in, then find out what you can support within the parameters of the class, and we'll talk about that in a second. But let me say this right now, what you can support is a literary analysis of the texts based on the work we've done. What you cannot support is a theological or spiritual analysis of this material. Um, I'm going to talk about that in a sec, but I know some folks are still having struggles finding that boundary and adhering to the parameters uh, of the class. And we'll talk about that in just a little bit. But anyway, if you're having trouble picking a paper topic, you might gaze through that. It works every time. Uh, and it's based on your interest. And then what can you actually support? What position are you interested in supporting? Can you actually support that position with, the, with evidence and research? And finally... Uh, are there other people that have attacked, had to tackle this same question so that you're not working in a vacuum, you're not reinventing the wheel? You know, this is not a doctoral dissertation. This is a, a, a research paper for um, an introductory literature class. So there's probably going to be other people that have worked on this material. So what are you interested in? Can you support your position from the evidence? And are there other people out there to help you besides me? Okay, number two, uh, the kitty cat essay, I've talked about that in the written part of this lecture uh, for some reason, and I, I still don't understand why after many, many years in this business, I don't understand why we teach and reinforce and practice and assess essay formatting and style in English 1A, and then students come into a literature class and are asked to write an essay and seem not to remember what an essay looks like in some cases. I don't know. I think it may be a fault on our side in the way we teach this stuff. But anyway, if you need a little review, there's a tiny little grade school level essay that you can use as an example. Yours will be much more sophisticated than that. But all the parts are there because this was designed for a lesson in, in a middle school English class. But all the parts are there and all the parts are present and easily visible. Um, so your parts all need to be present and easily visible, although they will be more sophisticated than that. Okay. Um, next, I've given you the sample intro I gave you last week to play with. Um, 
Let me back up a second and say, so an essay has to have all the elements that follow, the kitty cat essay, then all the stuff that follows are required elements of a college level essay that you're going to need to produce. Again, I'm not, I'm assuming this is, um, that you know this, and that this would be just review for you, that you're not learning this brand new. All right, so the next thing is I give you my, the introduction I gave you last week to play with. I'm giving you an annotated version now. I've teased out the structure. Most of you uh, nailed it pretty well. Those who participated in that discussion, you nailed the parts pretty well, although you kind of were hit and miss about defining certain things. But um, I've torn the thing apart. I've inserted comments uh, that show you the structure of the thing and the logic behind it. Um, there is part of a good essay is there's one rational mind reaching out to another rational mind. And rational minds need that structure, so the writer has to provide it. Uh, if you can, again, if you can't see my comments, uh, try uh, hitting up at the top, hit Enable Editing, and then go to Track Changes. Um, and I forget what the other one says. It's, it's a drop-down menu that says Track Changes. And then the next menu over says All Markup, A-L-L, Markup. Uh, if you do that, my comment should come out in, in, uh, in should be obvious for you, okay? So you may decide to look at that if you're having trouble with intros. Okay, I'm going to scroll down a little bit more. There's a resource there on how to write a good title. Uh, essay number two is not a title. Titles are part of the strategy that a writer uses to get a reader interested in the topic and to establish relationship with the reader. A good essay establishes a relationship with the reader. But the establishment of the relationship is 95% the writer's job. It's your job to establish the relationship. It's not the reader's job. It's, it's the writer's job to establish the relationship. And the way you do that to the very beginning of the thing is to write a good title. So essay number two is not a title. All right. Then there's some material, some further material about introductions and thesis statements. And then there's a PowerPoint that says basically what not to do. Don't let this happen to you. So what you can infer from what you're seeing so far is an essay must be an essay. An essay must have a title. An essay must have a, an introduction and a solid thesis statement. Again, this should not be new to you. I'm just reviewing for you. Don't think you have to read all this stuff. If you feel you need some review, you can skim through this very quickly, and it may help you. All right. Then there's the link to the Academic Skills Center. Don't forget, uh, and I have to make myself a note so I don't forget, I'm going to send them the prompt. Uh, the lady's name over there, I think, is Vanessa. I'm going to send Vanessa a copy of your prompt that you're working with. So if you go in there for help on your essay, they'll know what you're working with, and they'll know what you're supposed to be doing. Uh, I believe there's also some online virtual help that the Academic Skills Center is now providing for you. But there's the link to the Academic Skills Center. Tutors, advisors, English faculty are in there. Uh, if you need help, don't fail to get the help because the help is available. There's people standing, sitting over there waiting for you to come in so they can help you. Don't fail to use that resource. It's, it's for you. All right. Uh, and then... Uh, I've provided, i got to scroll down a little bit more. Okay, I've provided a sample paper for you. This, uh, one of your colleagues requested that I give you a sample academic paper. So this is not, I mean, it's, it's roughly sort of peripherally related, but this is the one paper I wrote for an LGBT literature class that I taught some years ago. And the students were frankly having the same struggles some of you are having, and so uh, in determining what to write, how to do a literary approach to the material. Uh, and so I said, okay, I'll write this paper too, and I'll do my requisite three drafts, and I'll let you students watch me do it, and I'll share the results of each step with you. Uh, and so as they were writing their essay, uh, I was also writing the essay. Uh, so I've given you the first draft, the second draft, and the final version Again, heavily annotated. Again, use the um, al allow editing, whatever the button up there is at the top, and open up track changes and all markup. And my comments should come out in either blue or red ink. You should be able to see them carefully. 
That's how the process gets done. That's how you write a good essay. Sitting down the night before the thing is due, you can't, it's impossible to do a good job. You can't do it. And ladies and gentlemen, you are not the one student who's ever lived who can bypass this process. This is how it works. There's no other way. Um, okay. Um, and then there's some use from other useful resources. The one I can't see it. Uh, the one I really recommend. Uh, well, the GORE PowerPoint is something I made up for my students years ago that talks about the process, four steps of going through the process to turn out a good essay. Again, it's a process. If, if a student is not willing to engage in the process, the student cannot write well. It cannot be done. It's too complicated. Nobody's that resourceful. Nobody's that smart, including me. Okay, that's how it's done. You cooperate with the process or you don't. That's your choice. You know, again, you're adults. Uh, and the other thing is there's a, a planner there that's really, really cool. You plug in the due date um, and it will calculate the time. You've got roughly a little less than two weeks to write this thing if you haven't started on it yet. And I doubt that most of you have. So pull up that thing, plug in your dates. Um, tell it when the thing is due, and it'll give you a day-by-day -day calendar of what you should be doing this day. You should be doing this right here. Uh, and you can even sign up for emails, and it will email you reminders saying, hey, you should be doing this right now. I hope you are doing this right now. Um, again, it's an incredibly useful tool. I use it myself all the time. Okay. Um, so there's a whole bunch of stuff there. Uh, I, again, I don't think that you need to read through all of it carefully. You might skim through it all. You might, um, especially if I come back and say, well, you're, you know, if I come back next week and you, I say, well, your intro is not very good, then you want to come back here and review that introductory stuff. Because I'm telling you that. I'm going to say, your intro is not very good. Please review. Or your thesis statement is unclear. Please review. And I'm going to send you back here to review this whole um, and frankly, it took me a couple days to assemble all this stuff for you. So use it as you need it. Um, okay, I think that's everything on the website. So point number two. Uh, I know some of you are still struggling with the parameters of this class. I'm going to take, well, I've been thinking about different ways. And uh, actually, uh, one of our colleagues has provided something that I'm going to probably put up for you. But let me let me talk about it one more time think about it this way there are parameters there are boundaries for this type of an inquiry okay um is it and the reason it's called bible as literature is it a, a literary approach to the material so as you're writing your papers you must have the intellectual and academic discipline to limit yourself to the parameters of the class. Um, some of you are still talking about uh, what God says here or what God's intending here or spiritual uses and, and things like that. Those cross the boundary into the into areas that this class cannot go into. So the way to think about it is there's a literary approach which we've taught and that's the boundary within which we need to stay. Now, I understand that your spiritual and uh, religious and theological life may be the most important thing in your life. And I understand that you may prefer to talk about those things. I understand that most of your discussions about this material may have been theological or spiritual. And you may prefer to talk about those things. Ladies and gentlemen, there are days I would prefer to talk about those things. Because I use this material uh, and other material in my spiritual practices too and I would prefer to talk about that some days but that's not what the class is designed to do it's not what you signed up for it's not what I get paid to do and it's not my area of expertise so if you start crossing the line and saying well God says this to his people right over here or this is God working out his plan for his people you have crossed the boundary into an area that cannot be evaluated in this class I can't do it I'm not one thing I'm not qualified for another thing it's not what you signed up for so um, 
if you're having trouble, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to help. But again, think about that boundary. Think about staying within the boundaries uh, of the parameters of what this class is designed to do. It's called Bible as Literature for a reason. And one way to think about it is if, if this were Shakespeare, as Gable says, we wouldn't be saying Shakespeare as literature. Shakespeare is literature. Uh, and you'd expect to, to study Shakespeare as literature. And if I were teaching Shakespeare and I started getting off talking about my uh, spiritual practices using Shakespeare's sonnets, you would wonder how come I'd wandered off into extraneous material. So this class works the same way. All right, so be disciplined. You're adults. You can do this. Uh, and I guarantee you God will not strike you dead for doing this. I think if, if God thinks about anything about this approach at all, she probably thinks that she's probably glad that we're respecting the material enough to um, to approach it from an intellectual down, to use the brains that God gave us. So I understand you know, some of you folks are used to using this material to support your spiritual or religious or theological practices. And you will want to take the material as that it's absolutely an account of events as happened, written down by someone who was there at the time, intended by God to be used for your spiritual growth and your theological growth. That's one position. The other position is... Um, sort of the opposite extreme, so to speak, a uh, person who says, oh, this is all completely made up, none of it ever happened, um, and God doesn't exist. Those are diametrically opposed positions which really participate in the same approach. Neither of those approaches is appropriate for this class. Total believer, total non-believer, your spiritual approach, your spiritual position is not appropriate for that. That is, talking about and writing papers supporting your spiritual position, your theological position, not appropriate. So the way to find that out is if you're talking about what God is doing here or what God says here um, or what God's plan is for his people here, you're doing theology. You've crossed the boundary. You need to come back. Because continuing down that road will, will uh, lead you into an area that I simply cannot evaluate for you. Same thing if you approach it from the, uh, the atheist standpoint in an attempt to disprove faith. That's theology. Yeah, it's kind of anti-theology, but it's theology. You've crossed the boundary into areas where the class cannot go with you. Okay, so um, again, watch your language. You know, what you have is in the evidence is not what God says but what someone heard God to say what someone human being believed and what they wrote down you have evidence of human activity um, it's a, you've played the game telephone you know what that works like okay I started out we go around uh, 25 people and when it gets to the 25th person it's nothing like what I said so for that person, number 25, to say, well, Steve said this, that's not true. Person 25 is saying what they heard from somebody else who heard from somebody else who heard from somebody else. This is how it works. Okay, and I don't want you to get into trouble because I don't want the frustration both for you and for me uh, of you giving me a paper that I can't grade because you haven't given me what the class is designed to teach. Uh, again, I'll know more when I read your drafts next week. And if, but if I say you're get, you're you're you've crossed over into theology, and by the way, if you're an atheist, you can cross over into theology too quite easily. Uh, if I say that to you, then you'll need to rethink your position. I'll try to advise you, but again, this requires some intellectual and academic discipline just like any other literature class does. does believe me I get the same uh, concerns in any old literature class because you, you may read you may read for pleasure but a college you, but just reading and reading for pleasure and sitting around and talking about how lovely it all is that's what you do at book, book club on Wednesday night that's what not what a college level literature class is designed to do Okay, so 
last thing about this uh, our approach is that this from a literary standpoint this material shares it is literary in, in one way or another because it shares certain characteristics with every other literature like this that's ever been produced by human beings so I can look at the evidence on the page and I can say here's what happened and I can say it with a fair amount of, of assurance that I know what I'm talking about here's what happened this material began at some point in the very distant future as an oral account somebody saw something or somebody was present at event at an event and they started telling other people about it and the thing became important enough that it became an oral tradition this is the case in every literature like this in the world ever this is true and again it's based on evidence that we can see uh, a lot of these uh, uh, later literatures it's, it's traceable back we've got the physical evidence so and then at, at some point somebody says oh this is really important to our culture and our understanding of ourselves and so we better write it down so we can preserve it so at some point and it's usually centuries distant often somebody writes it down and it becomes part of the ongoing written record of the culture so it starts out oral it transfers at some point to being written down so that it becomes part of the written tradition of the culture the idea is to fix it all right and then it goes around for a while uh, the, the one story is circulating around in written form and you realize of course writing it down in this time period eliminates a good portion of the population because a good portion of the population can neither read nor write so the thing is already beginning to go into the hands of the specialists so then you've got a bunch of stories that have been produced in exactly the same way in a culture and those stories are circulating around all loose out there together and somebody says well all of these stories are important to us let's collect them up let's get them all together in one place so that we begin to forge a coherent history that's step number three so oral written and then beginning to be collected and then at some you know point in the in the future somebody else comes along and they say well we have all these stories but they're just kind of stuck together and we need to create a coherent history out of them because now we have a fully formed culture that needs a, a coherent story to it so let's take all these things that we've collected up and let's put them together more carefully let's edit them and shape them into a consistent national narrative once that's all done then it, it's possible that the philosophers or the religious people or somebody else is going to come along and they're going to say well we have this collection of stories now let us interpret them let us figure out what it means let's understand it from whatever point of view theology philosophy whatever the point of view so all of these ladies and gentlemen every literature of this type in the world ever written has followed this pattern oral stays oral for a long time then gets written down uh, just the individual pieces get written down then the individual pieces get collected up and just stuck together and then the individual pieces get edited and, and shaped in, into a national history okay that process in most world literatures like this takes hundreds and hundreds and sometimes thousands of years to take place each stage takes centuries so what you are reading when you read the Bible is that end result somebody it started out oral somebody wrote it down somebody collected up the stories somebody edited the stories and somebody came along and interpreted the stories what you're looking at is the final end result all of those processes that take a thousand years let's just say but the thing is for our purposes each of those stages except for the oral one because we have no oral records of this material but each of those stages the people who worked on it have left tracks that we can find we can say we've got literature a b and c literature a b and c all produced in the same way 
all produced using the same stages and the people that worked on the thing left a mark at each stage so the JEP and D stuff you know those are people that worked on the text and they left marks which readers can see all right so all of that is by way of saying this when you analyze a text you are looking at the you are analyzing the end result of a process that may have begun a thousand or two thousand or five thousand years ago and you're looking at the end result okay and that end result was produced by a person or persons it was produced by a human being and the human beings were as they get more sophisticated they become writers and they use the techniques that all writers use so you're reading something again and this is based upon the evidence in th this text and every other text like it you're looking at the end result of a very long process of people working on this stuff you can trace that back you can stay in the literary mode and trace that back and write a very satisfying paper for this class but the moment you start saying well this is what God is saying here no what you're seeing is what somebody thinks God said or what somebody thought they heard God say uh, for our purposes if you wish to believe that God said this and it happened exactly as written you are welcome to believe that but you're crossing the line the boundary where we cannot go with you um, okay that's that's the that's all I know to say there are things we can do and do well there are things we're not going to do and the boundary I, I think the boundary is quite clear and I think you folks are mature enough you can recognize when you're crossing over the boundary and you know when you crossed over the boundary just stop don't go any further because you're wasting your time for this class you need to come back into the area where we are working and work with us and do a better job over here for this class all right so I don't know if that helps um, you know I went through the same struggle myself um, and yeah there's stuff I'd rather talk about but that's not what we're here to do you know you don't get to decide how the class goes I don't get to decide how the class goes I get to teach the class providing I stay within the parameters as defined by the college and the state of California and the academic world you know if I came into this class um, and started talking about my religious philosophies and my spiritual approach to the texts and I do have spiritual approaches but if I came in and all my lectures were about the spirituality or the theology of the Bible you'd say pretty quickly I'm not delivering what I promised you know he's talking about his personal spiritual approaches we want to learn about literature so your inclinations my inclinations however strong they are we have to work within the parameters and the parameters are fairly clearly defined for us it's a struggle it's difficult but with a clarity of vision it's um, approachable I've gone on too long about this and I'm really not going to revisit this um, I'm, I'm glad to try to help but um, typically we have to sort of help some folks you know define our work uh, <clears throat> some folks um, for whatever reasons and I don't know what the reasons are don't want to accept the boundaries as defined don't like them don't care for this approach um, and just don't want to do this work want to do some other work and so I find I have to keep circling back for those folks because those folks are often the most articulate ones who are most the most interested in the material but don't want to do this approach want to do some other approach that they like better and I have to sort of help those people you know define and clarify what they need to do so the last thing this uh, this uh, little video is going on way too long uh, is you need to pick a paper topic you need to get started writing this week don't wait any longer don't wait for inspiration to strike under the Bodhi tree like the Buddha it won't it won't it won't okay you need to get on with the job um, and whatever excuses if you're haven't started yet whatever excuses you're giving yourself get over them pick a topic and move on get the job done um, and here's I'm going to give you a topic if you're really stuck and you really can't figure it out uh, and you're having a lot of trouble 
then I'm going to give you a topic and I'm fine if everybody writes on this topic. I know there are some of you who want to go in other directions and that's perfectly fine providing you stay in the literary mode. But here's a nice narrow topic that will work very well for this essay because I've seen it work before and that is to take the Garden of Eden story, the Adam and Eve story and the story of Balaam and his talking donkey. Okay. Those are two stories. The reason I asked you to talk about form last week is the fact that those stories have a talking animal in them makes them a fable, F-A-B-L-E. A fable is a specific, narrow, literary form. Now, you may wish to believe that the snake actually talked and the, the donkey actually talked. You may wish to believe that. That's fine. You can believe whatever you want. But what you are... What you are looking at is a story that contains the elements of a fable. It is defined from a literary point of view as a fable. So, to say, well, the snake said this, you don't know what the snake said, you weren't there. Uh, neither was the person who wrote the story. So, you can't say the snake said this, you can say the writer has the snake say this. The writer puts these words in the snake's mouth. That's a literary approach. All right, so... A fable is a very specific kind of story. It has a very specific purpose. And there are bazillions of them out there. So if you don't know what to write about, and if you want to take something easy, look at the, look at the Garden of Eden story, particularly the talking snake, and look at the Balaam and his donkey, the talking donkey story. Those are fables. That's what makes them fables. They have the elements of a fable. Like you can look at a poem, you say that's a poem because it looks like a poem and it has the elements of a poem. Yeah, right. These are fables. They have the elements of a fable. They look like a fable. They smell like a fable. They are a fable. So you take the, the two fables in this account that we've read so far and you find, then you research the, the genre of a fable in a broader sense you talk about the purpose of a fable. Why does a writer write a fable as opposed to some other kind of literature? And then you come back and you compare and contrast. You say these two fables have these other elements with Aesop's fables or some of the Greek, uh, the Greek stuff. They serve a similar purpose and the purpose is uh, and so forth. Okay, so focus on the literary form find correspondence between the literary form here and the same literary form in other cultures, and then draw your conclusions about why that particular writer told, told that story in that way. Because that's what writers do. They choose from among the forms available to them, and they say, well, I've got this that I need to say over here, it looks like a fable would be the best way to say that. Or I have something else I want to express, looks like a poem would be the best way to express that. Or a play, or a novel, or a letter. So, um, again, however the original material came down, we don't know, but you have, at, at the end result, a writer took it and shaped it into a fable. And that writer followed the same processes with the same ideas in mind and the same end goals in mind as writers do when they write fables because that's what writers do. So my suggestion, if you really don't know what to do, take those two stories from this material, find yourself some other fable, one or two other fables in other cultures, draw your parallels, and write your paper. And if you, if you find yourself wishing to assert that the snake actually talked and said what the snake said, that's theology, that's faith, that's belief, you over the boundary, you need to come back. You need to have the discipline to come back. Um, and again, as I've always said, you know, God gave me a brain and she meant for me to use it. Uh, this is a, an academic discipline that you absolutely can do. Um, and it yields, to my mind, uh, incredible benefits in terms of critical thinking. You're about to uh, we're about to enter a stage in which people are going to be pumping all kinds of crap at us, uh, and we need to develop the critical thinking to examine what those people are telling us and find if they're telling us, if there's a grain of truth in what they're telling us, we need to be able to find it. 
Okay, so I've talked on way too much, but I hope uh, that, that this has been useful. But again, if you don't wait any longer to pick a paper topic, if you really can't pick one, or you don't want to go through the process of um, divining out what you're really interested in, if you don't want to follow uh, my little procedure there to find what you're really interested in, then write the fable story. Write Garden of Eden, write Balaam and his donkey, find yourself a couple of others, write the stories, draw some conclusions, uh, and you'll be fine. Okay? Uh, so, I uh, hope you're going to have a good week. I'm going to be crazy busy this week, but I will be in touch, and I'll, I'll uh, check in as often as I possibly can. Thank you. Bye.